Hey, hello everybody. This video is a result of something I saw today and um, my desire to put out a commentary. I can't say that this commentary is necessarily the most well prepared. Actually, it's off the cuff because a well-prepared and documented response would require a lot more time. But today I watched a very short video, but very well put together. It was the a reaction by um, the daughter of Rabbi Shmuley. Uh, because they have, uh, the rabbi and his daughter have um, filed a complaint with the FBI about Candace Owens. Um, I guess she's, um, I, I'm not sure what the complaint is, but it's it has to do with her basically campaign. You know, Candace Owens has just completely lost it. She's just falling into a dark um, hole, and I doubt that she will climb out of it. Something similar happened to, if you guys remember, there was a um, um, a commentator account a few years ago called uh, Education for Liberals, I think it was called, <clears throat> and uh, that guy... Um, fell into the same exact hole of Jew hatred, and um, I don't believe he's around anymore. I'm not sure, but he just he just went bonkers with Zionists and the Jews this and the Jews that, and um, I mean he he so very similar to Candace Owens, very similar. Now we don't know why Candace Owens became so obsessed with Jew hatred. But what we've learned about her is that her British husband, Mr. Farmer, um, he's the son of a, of a wealthy and uh, well-respected, I think, member of parliament. I'm not sure. And um, he's actually, his, his father is actually a friend of Israel, and he distanced himself just recently distanced himself from, without naming Candace, but a member, a high-profile member of their families, uh, how he put it, which was very good for him to do. Very, um, that's, that, that, that takes a lot of guts for, for someone to take a, a stand publicly, and it's because I'm sure Mr. Farmer, the dad, understands that um, there's greater spiritual violation here and it's so severe and it's so significant that it warrants a response. <clears throat> now, Candace Owens was raised up as a Protestant. I'm not sure what denomination, Baptist or what. I'm not 100% sure. And so was her husband, British guy. And... Um, he became Catholic, and she became Catholic. But what we found out is that Candace Owens' husband was big friends with notorious uh, pimp, Muslim pimp, Andrew Tate. And... He's been friends with him for many years before even Andrew Tate blew up and became some sort of a, a personality online and doing what he's doing. He's under investigation and, and about to appear in a trial for human trafficking and, and so on. And Candace Owens' husband was friends with him and Candace Owens herself was friends with him. So you have now... A convert to Islam, and as we know, sometimes converts are more more zealous than than Muslims themselves. A convert to Islam, who is a pimp, who is a human trafficker, right? He's friends with Candace Owens' husband, who converted to Catholicism, and so 
I'm not sure what kind of Catholicism they converted to, but it sounds awful close to the Catholicism of the Democrats who have no problem uh, wanting to see, uh, asking for death, uh, the death of Israel, the annihilation of, of Israel um, in favor of the Palestine, uh, Palestines, Palestinians. And so whatever Catholicism they converted to, it didn't help them to develop a healthy understanding of the Jewishness of Jesus. And somehow they ended up in a big squabble with um, Rabbi Shmuley. And as a result, uh, the rabbi and his daughter ended up uh, filing a complaint with the FBI. I'm not sure what to make of that. I'm not sure if this will um, result into anything. And I don't even know much about the rabbi and his leanings, whether he's a leftist or not. I'm not sure. But at the end of the day, uh, the purpose of this commentary here is a video that the rabbi's daughter recorded on X. And in this video, she is commenting on the fact that how is it possible that Christians would be anti-Semites when Jesus was a Jew, his apostles were Jews, the early Christians were actually Jews in the land of Israel. So how is it possible? That's the question she asked. I probably have to do a second video just kind of more specifically narrowing in on this and, and playing the video proper so you can hear what she actually has to say. Maybe I'll just leave the link in the description below so you can go to it and listen to it yourself if you want. But that's not that important. More importantly, the question here is, how is it possible to be a Christian, to read a Hebrew book about the Hebrews who gave to the world the Torah, or we call the Bible today, right? Who gave to the world the understanding of the, the moral code of what we call Western civilization, um, who gave us the Messiah, Yeshua the Messiah, who was a Jew, who were the de facto what Western Christians called the early church. Now, that's another fake terminology that also is invented to conceal from us the fact that all those people that we read about in the book of Acts, all of them were Jews with very few exceptions. So it was a Jewish movement, okay? And they were called the Nazarenes, the Nutzerim. And so at that time in Israel, there was no Judaism the way we know it today. That's another thing that she pointed out in the video, how is it possible since Christianity originates from Judaism? Well, yes and no, in the sense that Yes, Christianity is connected to and intertwined with Judaism, but the truth is, and I could sit for an hour and 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 share with you on this, that actually Judaism as we know it today didn't exist at the time of Jesus, neither did Christianity. What existed was the tradition of the Jews, the practices, the uh the, the temple, the uh, Torah, the rabbinic tradition, the rabbis were there, right? But the reality is, and the historic fact is, that what we call today religion, people at that time had no concept of this. What people did and what people were doing at the time of Yeshua, and that's for us as believers in Yeshua, that is the most important time, although you can't really even understand that time unless you understand the previous generations and the whole entire history of it. But let's just zero in on that time. During that time, there was no such thing as religion. It did not exist. In fact, the very word being used in the way we use it today to, for example, say the Catholic religion or the Christian religion or the Muslim religion or the Buddhist religion, that whole idea of a religion as a combination of beliefs and practices, right? 
That's a Western invention. Western invention. And that came about in the 16th and 17th centuries when all this, the, the Renaissance and the Reformation kind of opened up the Pandora's box of free learning. You know, let's, let's figure out the world. Let's learn about the world. Let's, let's, let's figure out everything. And that is the time when, for example, um, a lot of the people at that time who confronted Rome they also confronted Jerome's translation of the Bible because Jerome's translation of the Bible lasted for about a thousand years unchallenged. There was no other translations. And Jerome translated uh, what we call, or they call at the time, we call it today the Vulgate. And that is that is the, Ro- the Latin translation from Greek and Hebrew. Jerome lived in the what we call Palestine at that time was called Palestine, Palestina, or the land of Israel. He learned Hebrew, not Aramaic, Hebrew, and translated it from Hebrew into Latin and from Greek into Latin. And that translation, Jerome's translation, went on for a thousand years, for one thousand years, unchallenged. And so sometime in the in the uh, 16th century, right, a movement, a movement rises up, actually the 15th century already, right around the time of the invention of the printing press, right, 1450, 60, 70, around that, that time, a movement emerged known as Christian Hebrewism. And they begin to ask, well, wait a minute. Why are we? Why do we read the Latin text when that these things were not spoken in Latin back in the day? Okay, Jesus didn't speak Latin, so what did he speak? And the movement was called Christian Hebraism, and those were Christians who started to work with rabbis. To learn Hebrew because they realize the original language is still there and it's the, it's the language of the Hebrews and it's the Hebrew language. So rabbis begin to teach Christian scholars Hebrew. Up until that time, universities in Europe only taught Greek and Latin. But what, when Christian Hebrewism took off, in fact, some of the first printing presses the invention of the printing press, remember? Some of the first books printed during that time were manuals on how to learn Hebrew. Jews were one of the first financiers, and, and they, they helped foster this, this movement to know and to print books in Hebrew, right? And I believe um, in the beginning of the 16th century, there was only like three universities in in, in Western Europe, they taught Hebrew. But in the next 100 years, every major university in Europe was teaching Hebrew as well, along with Roman, uh, with Latin and, and, and Greek. So the question, what was the language? What was the original language that Yeshua spoke? Is not a small question. That's not my question. That's a question that they asked the greatest scholars and minds during that time begin to ask themselves because they just wanted to make sure that the text was was what it is, that it, that it's correct. And so they begin to dig up all the different versions of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the Torah and the Tanakh, the, all the prophets and the historical books and and, and a new tradition developed, which had to do with the translation of the, from the original text. So that's the reason today we have over 600 translations of the Bible in English alone. It goes back to that time because they began to realize the original language was Hebrew. And if we wanted to understand the meaning of what was said, we must understand Hebrew. 
So now when people learn Hebrew, then they get together, a group gets together, says, well, let's produce a new, new translation. And in this new translation, the emphasis is going to be on such and such, right? So that's the history of it. So I know I'm, I'm kind of veered off of the main topic here, but what is the main topic? The main question is that do we really have clarity on what came from what and what's the original source of what? Because if we don't, we run into the danger of believing in handoffs. Like someone handed you off some sort of idea or belief and you're like, okay, no problem. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that legitimate? Or is, is it made up? Has somebody made it up? If someone made it up, I'm just not interested. I'm not interested. So we need to go back to the time of Yeshua and to ask ourselves the question, what is the language that Yeshua spoke? What was his identity? You know, when you think about it, this whole thing with Aramaic, there's not a single line in the Gospels, for example, that has any relevance to the, to the whole Aramaic argument. The entirety of the Gospels is about Jewish culture. It's about Jewish people and, and their, their own history and teachings and concepts. Aramaic what? Aramaic means Syriac. And the fact that some of the letters were basically the whole story, the whole fraud with, with, with Aramaic is that Syriac letters were used to express Hebrew words. That's it. There was no Aramaic per se. I mean, there is an Aramaic, but specifically in, the, in how it was used, it was used, they borrowed some of the, some of the characters were used to express Hebrew thoughts and Hebrew words. That's it. And now <clears throat> they have created this whole entire uh, theory in, 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 in uh, Aramaic. And the Aramaic theory basically takes away. It's designed to take away from the Jewishness of the Gospels, from the Jewishness of Jesus. Because if we take away, then <clears throat> we, we are, we're, the, we're good. The more we de judaize Jesus, the better off these people are. So he must understand there is like an entire movement or a paradigm or a system that does not want to admit or accept the Jewishness of Jesus, the Jewish origin of the Bible, of the faith. Okay? Because that's a failure to them. Because they've been believing and 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 promoting these ideas since the 4th century. So for me to come up and say, no, phony baloney, the original faith was in Hebrew, it was Jews, that is a in the mind of Christian, arrogant Christian proselytizers, I guess you could call them, that's a failure. Because they feel like you took away something from them. Because they're not really promoting Yeshua, they're promoting their denomination they're promoting their Catholicism or their Protestantism or their Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, whatever. That's what they're promoting. They're not, they don't have zeal for God. They have denominational zeal. They have their religious zeal. So going back to the word religion, religion was not even a concept during the time of Yeshua. No one thought of religion no one was like, hey, how is Judaism doing today? No one thought like that. It was, you were born a Jew, and that's how you were raised, and, and, and you understood the world through the teachings of the rabbis and, and the Jewish people, and the culture, culture formed your way of thinking. Not some academic, not some PhD. It was no such thing as a religious life and non-religious life. It, it was all one. Life is life. Death is death. God gives life. God God gives. God takes away. These are all beliefs. And the fate was passed on generationally, culturally, right? 
so I'm going to I'm going to read to you um, something I pulled up from Chad GPT because I've been saying this for years, but now lo and behold, Chad GPT itself, Chad GPT itself is uh, confirming. And here's where it says, the question was, when did the term religion begin to be used first in history? Very simple prompt, not very long. And even so, here's what the answer of AI is. The term religion, as we understand it today, began to take shape in the 16th and 17th centuries. The concept of religion was not present in the original languages of sacred texts like the Bible or the Quran, nor in the cultures where these texts were written. Think on that. I mean, that alone, the concept of religion was not present in the original languages. That alone should be like, whoa. So the concept of religion is new, right? Nor in the culture. So there's no concept. There is no word that's being used. It's like totally fake the latin term religio from which the english word religion is derived originally meant obligation bond or reverence over time the term evolved to describe systems of belief this is what religion is systems of belief and practice related to the sacred or spiritual that's what the modern understanding of religion is that's how the western scholars defined it the modern understanding of religion as a distinct category of human experience is largely a product of Western thought, and it was not a concept that existed in many non-European languages or cultures, cultures prior to colonial influence. Oh my God. What are we going to do? You know, many years ago I heard Gert Wilders from the Netherlands say this, Islam is not a religion. And I just about fell off my chair. Why is that important? Because Islam is using religious freedom to penetrate the Western civilization, to compromise Western civilization so it can destroy Western civilization. They're using the protections of religious liberty because they present themselves as a religion but they're really not. It's just a way a Western scholars explained Islam and the way they explained Judaism and they explained Christianity, but that doesn't mean this is what they are. It's very similar to like, uh, you know, the po popular co culture, for example, will say, you know, we'll look at an automobile and we'll say, oh, this is a car car right but uh in many cultures car is has an actual proper term for example vehicle right and if you go to the court they're not going to talk about a car they'll talk about the vehicle or the vehicle did this uh, for example the local administration is called the motor um department of motor vehicle whatever right so the correct term for what we call today Christianity or Judaism right, is not religion. That's the explanation of some people, scholars. And somebody might say, well, George, you think you're smarter than the scholars? Well, some scholars are very smart. That's true. Some are too smart. So smart that they end up sounding like morons. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. We have scholars and scientists that are so smart that we ended up not knowing what is a man and what is a woman. So how smart are these people? And you think that there aren't theologians who are that dumb? Big diplomas on the wall, but they got bird brains. Big diplomas on the wall, but they can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. Same thing with theology. I don't care about their big diplomas on their wall. I want the truth. I want the truth of God. 
So when I speak of, you know, the Bible, I don't even speak of the Bible per se, because that's another term that was invented, right? It's the Torah, or the Tanakh, or, in my opinion, we should be speaking about the truth of God. Because there's no messing with the truth. The truth is the truth. The truth is actually bigger than the Bible itself or the Torah itself. The truth transcends learning, academic learning, historic learning, philosophical concepts and arguments and theological this and that. The truth is worth living or dying for. Nobody's died in like when you read about the first century and how Christians were persecuted. They didn't, they didn't die for a book. They died for the truth. Okay? When, let's say, somebody's family is under attack, what what are you willing to die for? What binds a family, for example, to be, you know, it's love. Technically, a man and a woman get married, they get a marriage certificate, and now they have a, a family. And now based on that marriage certificate, then you have children that have the name of the dad and so forth and so on. But is that a family? Is that what makes a family? Somebody's going to threaten the family and the dad comes out swinging and says, I'm going to show you a bad guy, you assaulting my marriage certificate. No. They're not fighting for a marriage certificate. People going to war, fighting with, with a foreign enemy. Or they're fighting for their marriage certificate. So that's that's kind of the, the the analogy here that I'm making is that the the written document is not really sacred per se. <clears throat> the written document speaks of a truth that's sacred, the truth of Yehovah, Yod He Vav He, the truth of Abraham, the truth of the Messiah. And there's a big difference. This is why I speak of the truth of God or scripture because it's the truth of God that truly opens our eyes. You can grab a copy of the Bible and read it and remain spiritually blind because you refuse to bow before God's truth, the the truth that he's the creator, which actually is one thing that brings us and Jews together because we believe in the same creator. And if we were smart, we would, we would definitely hold hands around those very important fundamental truths that the creator is indeed the same creator is the one that, that the Torah speaks of. And that's the same God that we all seek and worship. And really the only difference should be the fact that some of us believe a rabbi from Israel called Yeshua rose from the dead by God's power and he's the Messiah risen and he will come back one day to bring new new heaven and new earth. And some don't. But that's it. That's the one big difference. And we should not be going after the Jews because, hey... We now believe in the correct Messiah, so let's let's just kill these people because they don't really. Well, then, uh, based on the same premise, we should be going out wanting to kill all the Buddhists and all the Hindus, right? Because no, everybody who doesn't believe that that's the Messiah, we should just all go and kill them. So why Jew, why hating on the Jews? Oh, because they killed Christ. Really? Did they? No, he came to give his own life. So all Christians who talk about this nonsense about Christ killers and the Jews killed Christ, that is such low IQ. It's unbelievable. Like the lowest IQ ever. No, dummy. No, idiot. Yeshua came to give his life. No one takes it away from him. He actually said those very words himself in the Gospels. I came to give my life. So why are you going? What are you doing? You're now smarter than him. You're more uh, 
understanding, more more wiser than God? You're going to go after? How come Jesus didn't go after them? How come the apostles didn't go? How come you don't read anywhere in the book of Acts or anywhere Paul and Peter rising up and saying, yeah, let's just go and get those Christ killers. No, they were preaching the truth to their fellow countrymen, to the Jews. And between one third and up to half of all Jews at that time actually accepted the way of the Nazarenes. It took 300 years, over 300 years, before non-Jews became a significant part of this Jewish movement. That is the truth about the beginnings of Judaism and Christianity. They became, they, 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 they became formed together around the same time. They borrowed a lot of concepts from each other, actually. And they were one. They were brothers. And the way we should be today. So, <clears throat> the truth is that we worship the same Creator. We seek the same Creator. We seek to know the same Creator. That's why... I can read the words of the rabbis and, and study the rabbis and what they said with the exact same reverence or irreverence the way I study the church fathers. Because the church fathers said a lot of bad and stupid things. Some rabbis said bad and stupid things. And likewise, some rabbis said some phenomenal things based on, on scripture. And some church fathers have said some smart things, many smart things. But the reality is, that how is it possible that Christians today don't see all this and don't understand we come from the same source, from the same foundation? Because they've been brainwashed by the Greco-Roman Anglo-Saxon religious industrial complex. It operates at the seminary level. It operates at the book publishing level. It operates at the TV and media level. It operates at the pastor of your local church level. It operates at many levels, many, many levels of the Anglo-Saxon, Greco-Roman industrial complex that will not concede, that has no interest in conceding that the Messiah was Jewish, his culture was Jewish, and the most proper continuation of his mission was Jew and Gentile together to seek God to live in peace as brothers and to work out their differences in a gentlemanly and respectful way, not for one group to be going after another screaming Christ killers, which is the biggest nonsense ever. Okay. So I'm going to leave my commentary here, cut it short. I don't want it to go, oh, it's already past 30 minutes. What are your thoughts? Are you worshiping the Greco-Roman Anglo-Saxon Jesus? Does it bother you? Does it bother you? Why does it bother some people, some people so much when we talk about Yeshua, which was his actual name? That's a historic fact. I actually heard a guy on YouTube, if I can find probably easily his video, who, made, who, who recorded this whole video about how the real name of Jesus is Jesus. No, it's not. It was Yeshua. Okay? And only religious, stupid religious pride and arrogance, only stupid religious pride and arrogance is what turns these people into just little crazies. They just go crazy over this stuff. I don't know why. They lose their minds over this whole thing. They become ridiculously obsessed with it. And trust me, I'm against anybody becoming a maniac over something. I'm not a big fan of any kind of dogmatic, ideological extremes. People who go bonkers with the messianic stuff are just, just as bad to me. People go overboard with this messianic stuff to a point where they're just like, well, we now got, we got St. Peter by the, by the coat. We, 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 we really got it figured out. And so what happens is the religious spirit just breathes, breathes this arrogance. <clears throat> and it's so bad.
All right, what are your thoughts? Drop me a line. Love to hear from you. It's mostly for my friends, but I guess if you're visiting my channel, you can comment as well. Thank you.